please like our video and subscribe to Rotowire. Then go to rotowire.com slash pod for a free 10-day trial. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Rotowire Fantasy Baseball Podcast. It is a Sunday night. January 31st. We're almost done with January. I'm Scott Jensen. Join us always on Sunday nights by Jeff Erickson. And you can please rate or review the podcast. Just help out a lot. Helps people find the podcast. So I've gone on there. There's a couple of nice reviews recently, so we do appreciate that. Anybody that uh, listens to us and can help us out there, we do appreciate that. Jeff, uh, we're done with January. Getting closer to the baseball season, maybe. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm talking baseball. I'm with my good friend, Scott Jenstad. I'm happy to be here. Nice. Um, I'm not happy to be a Reds fan, but we, we and you're not happy to be an A's fan, so uh, we, we kind of right. bond that way, and uh, we'll go from there. At least your team didn't offer someone $12 million with $10 million of it deferred over the next 10 years. Yeah, that was pretty absurd, wasn't it? Uh, I saw like, that article. Why? Just, just you sit down and be like, dude, Marcus, we love you. We just can't sign you. We don't have the money right now. We're struggling with the state. Like, be honest. Like, to do that, it just was so, felt so yeah, insulting. Don't give a BS insulting offer, you know, at all. I'm and with like you a, on that one. Really insulting offer. You're going to pay you $10 million and we're going to do it till 2031? Like, get the, you know, I, it was terrible. Yeah, uh, I, I hear you. Um, but you know what? At least you're not starting Kurt Stillwell at shortstop this uh, this season, upcoming season. The A's might be starting Jeff Erickson at shortstop, so we might be off. Oh, I'm left handed. They won't be, they won't, they'll never work. <laughs> he might be our best bet right now. It's, uh, I think right now it's Nick Allen, who is, um, might be an elite defensive shortstop, like literally day one, but would be like sticking Jeff Erickson in the batting lineup. It's, he just literally can't hit. I mean, there's <sighs> just, it's just no way. It's, it's not Pinder. It's not Kemp. It's not Nate Orff. I think it's Nick Allen right now. And he, I think he only played at single A in 2019, but, they might just go for the defense. Like he's a really slick, really good defender. Like that is what his calling card is. But okay. he can't hit them. He's not going to hit the major league level even a little bit. Yeah, he's according to James Anderson, he's the A's seventeenth best prospect. You know, and, you know, sounds about right. Yeah, it's yeah, you're right. And A plus last year, seven ninety or not last year, two thousand nineteen, seven ninety seven OPS. That's that's not terrible. He can't hit. He can't. He's not going to hit the majors right now. He's going to hit like two twelve. It's going to be awful. Yeah. Uh, well, and but there's yeah. nothing out there. That's the thing that's so beguiling, not, not, so frustrating. Not yeah, not anymore. There was, but not anymore. Zach Cozart's out there somewhere, right? Uh, probably. Bring him back. But uh, yeah, so Saturday was not a fun day. Uh, the card, you know, Friday. It started Friday night with the Cardinals, and I know we're about to get yeah. into that. Uh, yeah. When the whole division's been dormant, and then all of a sudden the Cardinals just swoop in and say, "Okay, we'll make this massive move." You know. <laughs> Yeah. Great. Uh, and then, you know, the last viable shortstop get go, you know, and goes to the Phillies and D.D. Gregorius. You're like, ah. yep. and I knew that was going to happen. I mean, I yeah. had no I harbored no illusions that the Reds were going to be the big bidder on that because they're the one that sold off their closer earlier this offseason. They, they non tendered Archie Bradley so he could sign with the Phillies. And then yeah. added on top of that, they traded for the Phillies rule five guy. So they paid them money to sign D.D. Gregorius is the way I look at that there. I very much feel it, and it's funny because the Reds and A's are both a spot where, like, they could be contenders this year. Like, they could have yeah. some good young players, and, you know, especially the A's, like, their window was kind of 2020 to 2022 with, you know, the two mats and some of these guys. And just, I mean, I knew they weren't going to sign Hendricks and Simeon, but, like, the fact they weren't even, like, remotely competitive in thinking about it, it just uh, it says a lot. Yeah, it does. It does. And, you know, you and I will, you know, we'll rail against this here. But, and you're right. Like, the Reds, they spent last offseason. Now, granted, yep. they spent redundantly. Uh, but, you know, a lot of the low OBP possible slugging types. And in the case of Mike Moustakis, not even slugging as much. Although, I think there were good reasons why. And I actually have good hopes for him next, this upcoming season. But still, they have a clear deficiency. And they did nothing to solve it. Nothing. Yeah. It's, it's frustrating. So, we're going to talk about some news and notes here in a second. Um, we're gonna do uh, we're gonna do some mid range uh, intriguing names after that. We do like guys that are ADP two hundred to three hundred. Um, you know, I think a lot of people do the the first round, the second round, the first you know top hundred, and then a lot of people do the deep ones. So I want to kind of in that mid range, like rounds thirteen to twenty in a fifteen team. Or I think that's kind of when a lot of drafts are won. We're talking about some some intriguing names in that range. But first of all, I just wanted to hit with you. Uh, there was an offer made by MLB today. It sounded like one hundred fifty four games starting a month late then running a, a week late. So kind of, you know, you have to make up a bunch of games that are really compressed, schedule some DHs. Um, from a fantasy standpoint, how do you feel about this? I, I imagine there's going to be, you know, days off and pitchers getting skipped and stuff. The compressed schedule, I think, will be difficult to project. Right. Well, and 
Here, the devil is in the details, because the reason that the owners are offering this is they still want the expanded playoffs, and right. they want fans in the stands. They want the fairy tale. Yeah. They, um, they would love to punt April, as because as, it's going to be empty everywhere. They would love to punt, punt that month. But the right. weird thing is, if major player, the players' issue doesn't agree, the season still starts when it's supposed to start. So they have to be in spring training in like 10 days. So it's uh, it's nice that baseball didn't procrastinate this uh, too badly. Yeah, well, that that's the thing. This all started, like, well, I mean, it started probably earlier, but this all started leaking out. The John Heyman as the owner's mouthpiece. Sometimes it's Bob Nightingale, sometimes it's John Heyman. This time it came with yep. Heyman. And, uh, you know, they he said, well, the players have turned down a proposal of, you know, DH in exchange for expanded playoffs and some money. The devil in the details is how much money for those expanded right. playoffs. Because that's really where the owners make their money. Yep. It's an added revenue source. It's not part of their salaries. So they have to be paid for, it, you know. Yep. And also, there is the second order effects of what that does to the free agent market and the trade market. You know, yep. what what how the the bar to get into the playoffs is lowered necessarily when you expand the playoffs. Yep. And so that also means you don't have to spend as much as well. So that that's yeah. that needs to be negotiated. And of course, it was just reported there was an offer of this for that without the details. And the details are important. Right. Obviously, Very. they're important. Uh, and, you know, so it, it's not happening right now. Uh, but this is it is a starting point. Why this negotiation didn't ha happen back in November or at least, you know, we don't know. You know, the thing is, there's two different things that I, I'll complain about, though. One, and I complain about a lot of things, but why are we negotiating the media? But then why haven't we heard about it? Well, right. you, you can't have both. You know, yeah. so that, I'm a little bit hypocritical there. They may have been talking in November, for all we know, but I doubt it. There, There's no way that, I mean, we know the way Twitter and everything works out these days. That, that would have leaked out somewhere. But right. it's just wild. I mean, there was an agent that, that, uh, that tweeted out, like, you know, my players have made housing arrangements starting to show up in Phoenix and Florida in 10 days. Like, it's just, these players are in such a limbo right now. They don't know when they'll show up. Because if they if they agree to this deal, spring trade doesn't start till I think it was March 22nd. Whereas if they don't, spring trading starts in, like, 10 to 12 days. So it's... Right. Uh, it's uh, this week will be interesting. It's very much up in the air. I think the owners will uh, will find a way to kind of give it enough because I think I think they really want to avoid April as uh, it, it for games. Yeah, well, and you, there was the letter from the Phoenix communities uh, saying please yep. don't start it on time because of the pandemic, but don't pay attention to the fact that we got fans at our Phoenix Coyotes hockey game. And... I, I love I, I went and looked. I love the Glendale mayor sign that with they have fans at Coyotes games. Like it, it, that yeah. was that was crazy. So. Yeah, well, and then you saw the did you see the subsequent report that. Major League Baseball asked them to pen that letter. Of course, yeah. I, I, did, I saw something about that, but yeah, it, may, it certainly makes sense. Yeah, and so that just reveals the game. Uh, and okay, I get it, though. There is, you know, let's, for all the machinations of the owners, there is probably a health benefit. Not probably. There's a health benefit to delaying spring training in this season. Sure. When more people get vaccinated, the better off we are. Now, what's that threshold for where, what's the right level? Eh, I don't know. But. And, and I, I, I'm probably cynical, but I don't think that's their main reason. But, uh, oh, I don't yeah, think it's that at all. I don't I, think it's a, it, it, it's yeah. not even a reason, but. <laughs> yes, but it could certainly be argued that waiting another month of vaccines would be important. But, right. Well, let's jump into some real, actually real news. Nobody wants to hear us complain about uh, when the season starts. I hope, but uh, I hope we get some news pretty quick as we can kind of figure out when to do drafts and prep and all that. But that's strictly from a selfish right. standpoint. But you mentioned uh, Nolan Arenado traded to the Cardinals. We don't know the complete trade as of yet. We don't have the names coming uh, coming right. back to Colorado. We know there's like fifty million dollars going to the Cardinals in addition to Arenado. Arenado's an interesting one. He's someone that had had fallen a little bit in drafts off the off the rough 2020. He had some shoulder issues. You always worry a little bit about shoulder issues if it's going to sap power kind of going forward. Only at 253, eight home runs. Um, K rate was really good. It always is, but he was like 10% last year. Hard hit rate was down to career low. Barrel rate was uh, down to career low also at 5.4%. He wasn't very good last year. There was uh, There's no really doubt about I mean, for Nolan Arenado. Right. Um, how do you feel about this move? Uh, obviously, great for the Cardinals. You know, he's an elite third baseman. So on, on the baseball field, the real baseball, it's great. But fantasy wise, you know, Coors Field obviously helps uh, helps hit more than home runs. So batting average is definitely affected to a, to a big degree. How do you feel about Arenado? How far do you think he falls in drafts? Uh, I bet you he falls to the fifth or sixth round, probably, but not everywhere. I'll take him in the fourth or the the, the fourth or maybe even you know like early fifth, if, as the case may be. Pending, of course, what how I'm building my team, how my roster looks, and all that. I lowered his batting average projection from 298 to 283. I lowered okay. his home run projection from 36 to 30, 32. I lowered runs and RBI a little bit. With all that said, with uh, like our customized rankings, now granted, this is a complete projection-based set of rankings. It's not necessarily how I would draft or how you right. should draft, but you know, just basically straight up on the projections, it puts them at 47 for me. 
which is okay. above where I think he's going to go. He was already going in the third round and often, maybe late second in some cases. Yep. Uh, I think there's going to be an overreaction. Uh, there, there's a history of Colorado players doing just fine after they leave. They're not, not doing course field levels, but way better than road stats. And then, of course, there's the fact that he played through a shoulder injury last year. Yeah, I think that's the that's the big X factor in here is how much that was hitting your name. He, he, there were some quotes that he was pretty much dealing with it all year. And yeah. there's a guy that all you got to do is jump back a year, and he was 41, 118, 315 the year before that. I mean, just a monster right. uh, guy that was always in the you know middle of the late first round, early second round, right in there, depending on you know where pitchers went and what draft you, you did. But he's an interesting guy just because you just uh, you don't know about the shoulder, you don't know about the, about the move. But I think if he uh, it's certainly someone that if he gets the fifth round, I'm, I'm taking pretty quickly, I think. Yeah, I think so, too. Uh, and, you know, that, that'll that probably, we'll build that, it'll build that critical mass. We'll have a few drafts in the next, we'll have plenty of drafts in the next couple of weeks, and that'll probably reveal yeah. already uh, what the new level is for him. And then we'll see. I mean, yeah, granted, I hate, I, you know, like you said, we don't know when the season's starting and all that, but the later it starts, the better it is for a guy like him that's coming back from an injury. We also yeah. don't know, by the way, if he's fully healed. We just, yeah. Oh, one of my operating assumptions is that won't be a problem, but that's not necessarily true. You know, he, he could have lingering effects. It's not like he had shoulder re reconstruction surgery or anything like that. Yeah. Of course, we don't want him to have that, but you know, the point is it hasn't been, it, it could just heal itself, you know, with help or it may need surgery somewhere in the, in the future too. So that's also part, part of the, you know, the gamut of inputs that we're going to have here. But I, I would be happy to take him in many cases here. Third base is not that incredible. I mean, it's deep, but then it drops off after a certain point. You're like, oh, oh, there's there's all, all these flawed guys. Uh, I saw a lot of people like comparing him to Justin Turner, which I thought was probably too low. Uh, and not probably. I think it was too low. Uh, and Justin Turner is nowhere on the radar right now. He is draft being drafted really late. You know, yeah, doesn't I have a team. Too. That's yeah, kind no, of no team is a thing. Yeah. But – I'll give so point of comparison though. Alex Bregman's at forty two. I'd probably take Bregman over him. Next third base eligible guy is Kevin Biggio, who you and I both love. Our, yep. our it's pure, it's documented <laughs> uh, our love for him. But I think I take Arenado over him. I think I do too. It probably depends on who I have those first three or four picks. Whether I want some steals or batting average, and like it's a, I think it's kind of a piece in a puzzle there. But yeah, in a vacuum, I'd probably go Arenado. Because let's face it, if you're going to complain about Arenado's batting average, you can't turn to Biggio as your alternative. Absolutely. You can't turn to Eugenio Suarez as your alternative, and he's, you know, two rounds later. Moncada, you can't choose as your batting average alternative. If, you have I to have go seven, if I have seven steals and two pitchers, then maybe i got to think about something with some stolen bases. So it kind of depends, but right. uh, I I'm pretty sure I go Arenado first. Yeah. I mean, you have to go all the way down to Jeff McNeil for the next comparable batting average guy. Yeah, that's At the fair. position. Yeah, and McNeil's second, third, and outfield, so you can move him around too. But yeah, yeah I think that's about right. I think that's uh, right in the range. It's at, he, I think he jumps after the Rendon, Bregman, Devers tier, yeah. and then before, before Biggio, and obviously before Suarez and Moncada. Yeah, it's interesting how like that. There's almost two big. There's there's big tiers. Biggio's kind yeah. of between those tiers. It's a big. It's a big gap right there. And I, don't, yeah. I think a lot of people are going to play Biggio at second base too. So I think a lot of people when they draft him, you're trying to get him as a middle infielder. There's a there's a huge range between third baseman. That's crazy. From Devers to Suarez is two spots, and it's eight. It's forty picks. Yeah, I mean your boy Matt Chapman has dropped this year. Uh, he's down to one twelve because he's got his own injuries that we're worried about him recovering from, and other issues. I mean he also doesn't run. He also right. has a batting average risk and on a team that's not putting many more logs in the fire to compete this year. Yeah. And I, I mean, that's, the, that's a guy that I want to see in spring training, see how healthy it looks too. Cause a hip injury is something that, you know, you, you need on, he needs on both sides of the field, man. I want to see what he, how he looks in, in spring training. Me too. Um, so you mentioned Didi Gregorius signing with the, uh, signing with the Phillies. Uh, I think there's not much to say here. I think we kind of thought he was going to end up there, but just one of those guys going to be really solid. The batting average bounced back nicely last year. He hit 284 after the down year, uh, but he hit 16 home runs the year before in 82 games. I think it's a the solid the solid strikeout rates kind of helps the batting average. Hits a lot of fly balls, which helps the home runs. I think you know a, a 275 with like 22, 24 home runs somewhere in there is you, you can feel pretty good about getting that from Duty. Well, especially now that he's in Philly again, you know, yeah. and same if his, if he signed in Cincy, it would be the same thing. He's he's been a guy that's played in plus offensive environments his entire career. Yeah, going back to Arizona even. Yep. Uh, and you know, that, that certainly helps. Uh, he's not a great defensive player. 
Uh, so I might, my concerns might be overwrought. It's just the absence of alternatives at our, for our respective teams at shortstop. I think that's what yeah. got me so frustrated. I mean, I would have far preferred Marcus Semyon. I would have actually, and Anderson Simmons actually would have been a really good fit for the Reds because defensively, this is not a strong uh, club. He would have shored up a lot of that and instead he's doing it for Minnesota. So, you know, trades, trade market might be where it goes for both the Reds and the A's. Uh, a lot of teams are choosing to try to improve through the trade market rather than through uh, free agency anyhow. I, can I, I can I interest you in Nick Allen? Can I interest you in – hold, please, while I get up his name again because it's, you know, it's not a household name. Kyle Holder. Would you like uh, Kyle Holder for Nick Allen? Uh, sure, why not? <laughs> I don't know. Do you know James, I, I, James, will, James will yell at one of us uh, for this yeah, trade. but for sure. <laughs> Uh, another big signing, uh, Eddie Rosario, who was uh, who was released earlier uh, by the Twins a couple months ago, uh, signed with the Indians. I think it was one year, um, one year eight million. Uh, yeah. I like the signing for Cleveland. I think it's a good spot for him. I think it's a spot where he slides right in, doesn't have to worry about playing time. I think that he can sit, hit in the middle of the lineup somewhere. It's one of those guys that's just really solid. I think he might be better for fantasy baseball than regular baseball. You know, not a lot of defense that. there. Um, but you, know, you look back at 2019, 32 home runs, 109 RBIs, hit 276. He's one of those solid power bats without the the batting average downside. He's always like between 260 and 275, somewhere in there. You're going to get some pop. He's not a super hard hit guy or barrel guy, but, you know, hits enough uh, enough home runs. He's going to help you. Doubled his walk rate last year, which was kind of nice. Um, I think just a solid bat and someone that uh, if I need some pop with a, you know, I don't, I don't have to risk, risk the batting average. He's a nice fit. Yeah, I'll say this. Um, there's a batting average trend. Now, I don't know if it's, it's only a couple of years and it's two months last year, but 288, 276, 257 last year. Uh, not much of a walker, although he did walk more last year than in previous years. He did. Defensively, his range has gone down, but his arm is great. Uh, and I think maybe being on a different team, maybe teams will forget that a little bit, maybe run on him a little bit more, try to run on him at least initially a little bit more. He's not going to really run a whole lot for you anymore. No. Uh, three stolen bases each of the last two seasons, albeit – Three stolen bases in 60 games is not 360. Right. Three stolen bases, 162. Um, I thought it was a little surprising at the time when the Twins non-tendered him. And then I, I looked too. into it a little bit more. It's like, well, yeah, he probably, you know, it, it's probably an overpay, but not as much by not, by not by a whole lot, but still I can see maybe why they did it, uh, that he's not that much better than an alternative. They could slide right in there in, in the case of Minnesota. So we'll see. But I do think he's a, just a, Head and shoulders better than what Cleveland had. Um, I mean, he's he probably hits third, right? Yeah, it's still trying to figure out the the Indians' batting order. You know, they, if they put Hernandez at leadoff, yeah, and you uh, go J J Ram and then Fran Mills high hitting fourth, and you split up. Uh, you get a lefty in there. I mean, it seems like it works really well. Yeah, it could work out. Uh, you know, we'll see if where Naylor fits in this. I think he's yeah. going to be part of that equation somehow, some way. Uh, I, think I think Rosario and Naylor are probably three five or five three, right? Yeah, and then. I, what what they do with uh, Jimenez and Rosario uh, Ahmed Rosario are the uh, two other big question marks they're figuring out their lineup. But yes, they needed another bat. He is that. He is good. He, he's a help on that. Yeah, and good place to hit. I think it's. Uh, I think it works really really well. So I think it's a really a really solid fit. Yeah. It was nice to see the Indians spend a little bit of money too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, all, all my, our legion of listeners that complain about me the complain about me complaining about the Indians not spending money will have a little feather in their cap. There you go. A couple other minor signs this weekend. I'm just hitting guys for this weekend. Obviously, the other podcast hit the ones during the week. But uh, Jock Peterson signed with the Cubs. Uh, yep. Coming off his big 2019, we had 36 home runs. Uh, 2020 was rough. Uh, 190, did win the World Series of the Dodgers, uh, but only had seven home runs. Um, how do you feel about Peterson going to Wrigley? I like it a lot. I really like it. I like the idea of getting him, buying him at his lowest point. He was dealing with some personal stuff uh, last year. And I think that probably affected him. the off the field, affected the on the field. The Dodgers also, I mean, they have so many options that yep. once you start underperforming, it's easy to get lost in the wash. Uh, and I think in Chicago, they're going to need him. They're really going to need him. Uh, and he, he might even face some lefties from time to time. He's the classic example. Uh, you know, my, our, my friend Gene McCaffrey always used to complain about lefties getting platooned immediately from when they got called up. And they never face enough left-handers to overcome that. Yep. Uh, whereas righties don't usually have that bias to, uh, that they have to deal with. They just have to face right-handers and get over it usually. It, you know, a few exceptions here and there. But point is, 
you know, I think with some more exposure, he might get better. It's kind of like Jesse Winker did with the Reds last year. He, he faced more lefties, and voila, he actually got better against them. Yeah. I think the key is the, what you said, they, they need to use him. I mean, you look at their outfield, and he's already their second-best outfielder. I mean, he's better than Jason Hayward is right now, as at least as a hitter. Mm-hmm. And there's just no – there's like not, not anybody on the bench that he's blocking. I mean, they've got David Bote. they got Philip Irvin. There's just nobody there that you're like, oh, if Peterson starts slowly, maybe that you know he's going to lose playing time to this guy. But, I don't know, you give me Peterson with his, you know, hard hit rate and a barrel rate over 10%, I think he's going to hit. Um, I think last year, just, you know, like you said, just kind of – Got in a slump and couldn't get out of it. And the Dodgers, uh, you know, they have so many pieces they can move around. Um, I think the home runs will come. I think he, he can hit, be a guy who hits 240, 250 with 30 home runs. I, I mean, the price is going to rise now that he has a spot. His ADP is like 377. I imagine it goes maybe up to 300 or so. But I think if you need some pop right there, he, he fits nicely too. He does. He does. Uh, don't try him at first base again, though. That just didn't work. Boy, was that not pretty. No. Uh, Adam Wainwright also uh, re-signed with the Cardinals. I don't think anybody was surprised that, uh, you know, him and Molina, I think it was pretty clear that they were going to go Cardinals or nowhere. Uh, Wainwright had a wacky, really good 2020, a 3.15 ERA in 65 innings. Um, I'm not buying it here. I don't know if uh, if you have anything there. I just, uh, you know, his fifth was 4.11, not a lot of strikeouts. Uh, did have a nice walk drop, but um, I'm not buying it. I don't, I'm not buying that smoke again. I just think that, when he's going on his good days, he's good, and his bad yeah. days, he's bad, and that that's when you got when you kind of go down that curve. I think he'll have every dog has his day, and he'll have him, and he still knows how to pitch, and that get that covers yeah. a lot of ills. Uh, so when he's got good command, he can get he has good and decent enough stuff to get by. It's just at some point maybe that drops off, but you know his K percentage was stable last year. His walk rate dropped. That's that's a good starting point. He actually yeah. got more swing and miss last year too. Went from 7.6 to 10.8 last year. So he actually was tangibly better than he has been in recent years. So, yeah, I don't – I'm not – He's fully free. His ADP is like 440 or something like that. I just – he's a guy to me that feels like every time you think – every time you want to throw him out there, I just always worry about that big blow-up start. Because you you mentioned the stuff. If the stuff's a little bit off, he's going to be just super hittable right away. Yeah. You know what, though? He also was a central division pitcher last year. That's true. And you know what? I – I, I wrote a whole, you know, whole piece in the magazine uh, about Central Division stars. So didn't include him. Now I look at it, you know, with him, his trend: four forty six, four nineteen, three fifteen. Whip: one forty six, one forty three, one oh five. Yeah, I think he might have benefited from that schedule. Uh, I have him at three ninety eight, one thirty three this year, which is still better than the two previous years. Yeah. Actually, if you want to go back to two thousand seventeen, it's five eleven, one fifty for crying out loud. Yeah, uh, everyone thought he was crispy, and now here he is. He actually was the Cardinals' best pitcher in the playoffs, at least. He was. Uh, I, uh, actually, I don't think he was good in that playoff start, now that I think about it. I'm trying to remember. I don't remember exactly what. Uh, the playoffs were all a blur last year. He went three and a third, oh. allowed two runs <laughs> on six hits, two walks, and three strikeouts. So, eh, not That's great. He was staked an early 4 nothing lead and couldn't get out of the fourth. Yeah, that's not uh, not one you're gonna be happy with, right there. No. Nope. Um, so let's see. Let's uh, let's jump into the, some uh, some intriguing names after the top 200. I think it's kind of all the all the big news. But first, a note from our sponsor, uh, Monkey Knife Fight. Now that your season long fantasy based basketball and fantasy hockey leagues have started, this is a great time to check out our friends at Monkey Knife Fight, the fastest growing site in daily fantasy. The NHL and NBA are in full swing, and the NFL playoffs are also. We've got one more game left for the Super Bowl. This time is now. It's time to now take advantage of the 100% instant match up to $50 on your first deposit by using the promo code ROTOWIRE. Visit monkeyknifefight.com and use the promo code R-O-T-O-W-I-R-E today. So, Jeff, first name I want to talk about is someone that uh, was like a first or second round pick a few years ago, or maybe four or five years ago. It was A.J. Pollock in, in Los Angeles. We were talking about the Dodgers a little bit earlier. He kind of quietly hit 16 home runs last year. I think that that never surprised. I remember him doing well, but that never jumped out to me pretty good. 210 plate appearances, hit 16 home runs, more than he hit the year before in 342 plate appearances. Uh, K rate's really solid. Uh, you know, it's really consistent. Always at 21 percent, about uh, just right in there. The last three years, um, batting average is kind of always the same too. He's always about a 265 guy. Nice, uh, nice jump in the hard hit rate though. He's up to 43 percent last year. They all rate over 10 percent. Two pick two took two big jumps up there obviously in a short season but uh the playing time might be a little bit better than it was you know Kike Hernandez is gone uh Jock Peterson we just mentioned is gone so maybe it opens up a little bit although you know they got Galvin Lux they got Chris Taylor still some guys there but uh how do you feel about Pollock at an ADP of 200 exactly I like it um I I, ha- I haven't gotten them either my two DCs yet but I think I feel like I should have 
he, he's one of those guys that kind of hovers there for a while. You're kind of like, why isn't he going? It's because everyone's been burned before. I get it. I'm looking at my projection. I might be a little too optimistic on his playing time. I've got him at 139 games, 498 at bats. He's done that once in his career. Uh, although, yeah. essentially twice, really. But the, the last of those was 2015. So I'm a little Pollyannish here. I, he made it through a good, a full year last year and didn't get hurt. And it was great. He, he showed what he looks like when he's healthy. Yep. And that, that's, that's a really good player. You know, uh, you know, he doesn't run as much as he used to. Only two stolen bases last year, but 16 homers and yep. 56, 55 games. That's that's pretty sassy. You know, the lineup's good. He's going to score. Yep. You know, counting stats will be there if he plays. Uh, yeah, I, I'm. I, I think I need to be, you know, cut down the playing time just a little bit. But this is a good player when he's healthy. Yeah, and, and you're right. The, the stolen bases are gone. I think that's important. He's not that. That was that's what made him an elite guy before he has. Seven steals in the last two years in 141 games. So maybe, uh, you know, maybe six to eight steals someone there's probably what you get. But he's a guy that yeah. I don't think you want him running anyway because he's going to find a way to hurt himself. So anything you do to avoid um, any sort of contact or uh, anything to hurt himself, I think you just want him healthy. You want him out in the outfit. You want him out there as many days as he can. They'll obviously give him some off days with their depth. But mm-hmm. I think it's about the right price. I think that if you need some pop in the, in that uh, spot without like, another guy, another guy with pop and, you know, a, a decent batting average floor and, um, as you go along in drafts, uh, you know, paying for power starts to get a little more dangerous. You get guys with, with bad batting averages. Right. And, you know, looking at the Dodgers playing time situation, you know, uh, we know that both Peterson and Kiki Hernandez are gone. They've yep. signed elsewhere. Justin Turner's unsigned. There's some, you know, some scuttlebutt that maybe he'll resign with the team. But there's at least two spots opening up. Now, Gavin Lux steps into one of those a little bit. Taylor can get some more playing time. Edwin Rios is a guy I'm high on. I like yep. him a lot, and uh, I, I, I want to get him, some shares of him. But it it's looking rosier here for Pollock, you know, whether it's in the outfield or just as a DH, you know, the, the, he's going to get his chances here. Uh, as, as long as he stays healthy, I kind of, I just, I really kind of like him here. So, yeah, I, I, I imagine myself getting him in a lot of places if he, if he continues to stay at this sort of price. Yeah, I think I think I'm with you there. Uh, I want to jump down now to a couple pitchers who kind of fall in the same bucket as guys who um, took a huge step up in their strikeout rate last year. Obviously, it's a, we know it's a short sample, but uh, you know how much do you believe it? The first to pick 202 is, is Zach Eflin on the Phillies. Uh, 3.97 ERA last year in 59 innings, a 1.27 WHIP. He had a 4.13 ERA in 2019. I think the key, like I said, is, is if you buy the strikeout rate bump. He was an 18.3% strikeout rate guy in 2019, 28.6 in 2020. Now, you look a little closer, he did change his pitch mix, which you know makes me think that maybe some of that is real. He threw most sliders. He threw more curveballs. 43.9% whiff rate on his curveball. He threw that 30% of the time. He really found that as a as a strikeout pitch for him. Threw a lot mm-hmm. more sinkers, a lot fewer four-seamers. So when I look at guys where I see this bump, obviously we're only in his 59 innings. You know, you got to be wary of that. But if I see someone that I can, tangibly change up their pitch mix i'm a little more confident that maybe it's here to stay yeah it changed the pitch mix and the velocity stayed up that's a, that's a that's a good thing ground balls went up ever so slightly home runs yep. went down ever so slightly they're still kind of high but then again it's baseball in the 20 in, in 2020 you know yes, in 2019 it when it's high for everybody although it's not as bad as like when it was in 2017 when we first came up so there was some progress there i mean it was just a huge spike in the k rate um yeah i can see it uh i haven't the funny thing is I felt like I was higher on the crowd on him last year and haven't felt that way this year yet. But again, talking through this might make me give him a slightly better projection. Like I've got him at like last year, I think his K per nine was 10.68. I've got him for 9.17 so far this year. Maybe I need to bump that up just a little bit. The other thing I like is, I mean, solidly in the rotation. He's there. He's yeah. their third guy right now behind Nolan Wheeler. And then you've got, you know, get Velasquez. Maybe you got, the ghost of Matt Moore coming back and being the rotation, but there's no, it's not like he's getting pushed. Like I think in the last couple of years, it was like, he, is he going to win the job? Is he not? And I think that, you know, him just solidly that mix going to spring training, knowing that he's got a job uh, that, that can only help him too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, ballpark doesn't help him getting real Muto back, getting a better bullpen helps. One of the things that the Phillies have done and uh, talked a little bit about this on XM, we'll probably do more so during the week. Is they've really made a point of trying to add velocity to their bullpen. Uh, they had the fewest 95 mile an hour plus fastballs thrown from uh, their bullpen last year in baseball. The Dodgers had like nearly four times as many. 
that makes sense. It felt like every time the Phillies went to the bullpen last year, something bad happened. It was just, it was so bad. It was so, so rough to watch. But they added Archie Bradley. They added Jose Alvarado, like you said. I mean, Jose Alvarado throws gas. And if he can stay healthy and, yeah. you know, he had a lot, he had some family stuff going on last year. But if he can just kind of get out there and throw, like, I mean, dude, that's nasty stuff. Yeah, they added Coonrod also, another uh, gas thrower, f- was on the Giants last year. Yeah, it, it, it's a lot of that's untapped. But here, and here's the thing, you know, they're going to try to win. You know, that, yep. that's one of the things that they're really trying to do, really push for it there. You know, you don't hire Dave Dombrowski to do a rebuild. You do a day, you hire him to win right. now. And yeah. so that's what he's trying to do. Yeah, I uh, as I look closer at Eflin, he was someone that I got more interested in. He's going to be probably someone that I'm, I'm looking to target at that range. The guy after, similar kind of uh, cave up last year, someone who I'm not looking to attack is Drew Smiley, who signed with the Braves. Um, he's got a lot of buzz right now. He had a huge strikeout rate last year in his 26 innings with the Giants. Uh, granted, it was 26 innings, but um, you know, 2019, you look and it was it was really awful. 114 innings, 6.24 ERA. Yes, 6.24. It is actually is correct. Mm-hmm. Uh, 23, 23% K rate, 11% walk rate. He's topped 115 innings once in the last four years. Granted, last year doesn't really count. He couldn't have topped 115, but. He's really good in the past. He was really good in 2014, 2015, low three ZRA before he had all his injuries. I just don't see it at the price. Like, I like Eflin way more. I mean, Smiley went five innings twice last year. So, like, he's just a guy that I think you're going to get a lot of frustrating four and two thirds, five and a third leaves with a tie game or who knows what happens there. But I just I, I can't get on board of the price. I know a lot of people love him. The K rate was gigantic last year. Um, I'm just not buying him. What's the velocity jump? He went from 91.2 to 93.8. That's a huge jump. Uh, and the presumption in he's, is he's finally healthy. Uh, he's never thrown that hard. He, he's like a driveline success story. I think that's one of the reasons why he's trendy. Uh, I will say this, though. Going to Atlanta is not a good place to land for pit, you know, for pitching. I mean, it's some sometimes you, you can, you know, it's not like going to Coors Field, but right. it is a hitter's ballpark. Uh, that, that could bode poorly for him there. Although San Francisco played a lot harder than, I mean, played a lot harder for pitchers last year than it's done in a long time because of the, they moved the fences in and because and they, they changed they, the wind currents yeah. too. They closed, they closed the uh, three archways in right field, the, the not whole game kind of thing in there where you can look through the fence. But I just look at his game logs. I mean, the strikeouts are great, but I mean, you look at, you know, four, four, three and two thirds. I just never think he's going to be a guy. I think wins are going to be really hard to get with him. Um, you know, and maybe he knew he was going for innings and he gassed it out, gassed it out. That's why the velocity went up. I just, uh, at the price, I am. Uh, I'm not buying him. Was that because of his finger injury, though, that he went so short? Although, I guess quid pro. You know that that that's yeah. Right. Yeah, that's well. Yes, because he had a finger injury. <laughs> there you go. He only made four starts in September. You know, was out from August first through September tenth. I mean that. Yep. Yeah. I see it. Yeah. I I can see why you'd be circumspect about him. There are a lot of people that really like him, and you know sometimes uh, it's uh, you're not going to agree with everybody. And I think that I'll probably be in the minority on that one, but I think the price is too high for me. Yeah, uh, well, I'm got to look up. You know, I just wanted to look up see if uh, like any if there's some recent prices that maybe you know defined his range a little bit there. I mean, if I think sometimes these guys like yeah, I don't like I don't buy in the price. You get him at the low end of your range, okay, it's worth the chance. Like his his range is 175 to 281. If you yep. went towards the low end of the range, would you still would you be interested? Sure, yeah. There there'd be a point where those uh, those strikeouts and I can kind of uh, finagle him in there. But at the ADP, I wouldn't do anything. And it, certainly, I, I don't think he. I think he's be a guy that's going to get more popular if anything as we go along and closer to, to the major draft season. Yeah, as pitching start is get and pitching's already pushed. I don't it know is. if you've noticed, but it is. Yeah, I've noticed. Yeah, because I know you haven't done any drafts because you know you don't ever do drafts in January. But I see I see Greg posts uh, boards and the, the the amount of yellow that comes up in like the second or third round is is wild. Mike the Mouth wanted me to get on you about not joining his draft, but it's like you know I know you don't even do drafts that early, so yeah, but. I can't. I don't. I'm not a big draft champions person. I think the format's fun. Just I like managing teams and I love. I'm one of the w- weird people that actually likes Fab during the season, and uh, that you was are a. Weird. No, that was a bit pricey for me for a non-fab league, to be honest. Understandable. Well, I yeah. love Mike, but uh, I had to pass on that one. Yeah. Uh, let's jump down a little ways here. Um, you mentioned a guy you wanted to talk about, uh, Jared Kalenic in Seattle. Um, didn't did, has no stats from last year. Obviously, he did not play with the Mariners. They were very clear at the beginning. I think like right right at the beginning, they were like they told his manager or his agent, "You're not gonna, he's not going to called up." Uh, sounds like they were not happy about that. I read a story about yeah. that. Him and his agents not only thought he should be called up, but thought he should start the season with Seattle last year. So um, if they did that last year, I have to think they're going to hold him off for the you know the free agent deadline this year, whatever, however many weeks that may be. But 
I mean, this is a guy that can hit. He's 23 home runs, 20 stolen bases in 2019 across uh, single and double A in 100, uh, 117 games. The sixth overall pick in 2018. He's 21 years old now. You see all the – we that's the one guy we saw clips from the, the alt site, like hitting bombs. He right, has a, he has a right. sweet left-handed swing. There's plenty of spots in Seattle. I mean, you got Marmalejo, so you got Evan, you got Evan White, you got Ty France, you know, guys that are holding down spots right now that you don't really think can hold uh, someone like Kalenic back. How do you feel about him at the price? He's two uh, ADP is at two nineteen right now. Got a pretty big range, but that's about the fifteenth round. It's you got to probably commit to four to six weeks on the bench if you're going to take him, though. I think. Yeah, at least three. Yeah, uh, unless they sign him for like a long term deal early on like and i just don't think seattle's gonna do that well i don't think he's going to do that yeah, seattle probably- has done that they did it with evan white i don't think they're opposed to it i think it's more right, clinic right. i mean i don't think they're gonna afford the price you know he's gonna be more expensive than white he, he's more ready and uh, you know and you, as you alluded he's bitter and his agent's bitter of course and the thing is they're probably justified in 2019 he was destroying double a now it was 21 games, so you could say, okay, well, it probably needs some seasoning. But the fact is, he he was robbed of that chance last year. Yeah. And, and, he, and he's a guy that probably would have, you know, not gotten called up late last year. But a minor league season for him last year would have been huge because he could have kind of kicked the door down and forced their hand and made him made them start with him this year. And losing 2020 for a guy like that, I mean, that, he's going to lo- end up losing – that year and probably you know service time this year it's really gonna it's gonna cut him back a year for agency he's not he's it's just gonna get more bitter if anything right seattle's a sleeping giant by the way they have their farm system's pretty stuck pretty stocked you know except they're, except they're seattle they'll figure out a way to mess it up i'm sure they will but, but they, they are they are very stocked up they're gonna be they should be really good in two or three years i mean julio rodriguez uh Marte, george kirby logan gilbert all those guys are exciting taylor trammell you know kind of his luster is kind of dimmed a little bit uh but this is a this is a really good farm system, and yeah. as you alluded, aside from like Kyle Lewis, who's the, who's there to block anyone? I mean, not nobody else there is like long term locked in. I mean that that so that I guess that's part of the point uh, is that they don't have a whole lot of building blocks right now. They need these guys, but that also means they they when they're ready, they should get that chance. Absent stupid uh, manipulation there. Can I uh, segue and ask you a side question that's not between 200 and 300? Yes, you may. How do you feel? How are you on uh, the uh, the sexy and exciting Dylan Moore, who people seem to love in drafts this year? So I, I have an affectation for him because I picked him up in Tout Wars last year after one week. and How, how did that work out? He, he was useful. <laughs> yeah. I kept on getting beaned. I, I'd like for that not to happen, but... Uh, He's not even guaranteed to start at second base. Uh, yeah, I, I read that story too. I, I think that I think his leash is pretty good, at least getting at bats somewhere. They may move him around, probably, but I probably. can't fathom. I can't fathom they're sitting him or using him in like utility where he's starting four times. I just can't. I can't see that. Although it is Seattle. But I also have a. I could see. Uh, you know, he has forty days and nights where he struggles, and yeah. he's out of a job pretty quickly too. I and mean, there's no pedigree here. Uh, seventh round pick, you know, took a while to get to the majors. Yeah, he could be Whit Merrifield, or he could be just white out. I mean, you know, there, there's there, there there's a pretty wide range of outcomes here. I, I like the fact that he's got some power to go with that speed. Uh, I think teams are going to care more about scouting him though this year too, and I'm I'm curious to see what sort of effect that has on him. Yeah, I mean, you talk about the guy who hit the ball hard. I mean, a 13.8% barrel rate, 45% hard hit rate. I mean, it was it was legit and supported and justified. He struck out 27% of the time, so maybe that's a little high. He was 33% in 2019. He played 113 games. He's one of those guys that his ADP is, oh, is 113, so you got to take him in the eighth round. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's someone that, like, he, I, there's so many so many extremes of that spectrum, what he could do. I, he could, you can see he could burn out. He could be really, really good and – He's, I have trouble with those kind of guys. Like I usually end up not drafting them just because I, I, there's always someone I'm going to like a little right. more and feel a little bit safer for. But there, I, I admit that the upside, the upside if, certainly looks like it's there. If you go strictly by my projections, you won't get them. Because I only have them for like 437 plate appearances, first of all. Uh, so that's automatically going to depress him. I think he's going to hit in the mid, mid-200s, 240, 250. He's going to run. You know, he gets caught a decent amount, too, by the way. So it's not like if he loses, he can't really afford to lose much of much of a step. 
I, uh, I assume I assume the light's pretty green for him in Seattle, at least. I think they, they like to run a little bit, so I assume that'll yeah. help a little bit. But like, you look at you look at the position. If you look, just look at uh, whatever second base right there. There's just no way if I'm in that range, I take him over Mustaka. So there's probably no way I'll ever get him. Yeah, I I, I think he's like, uh, and and he's going higher and higher because people need stolen bases. As, yep. as we, you know, as as we get closer and closer to opening day, that's that's one of the uh, annual trend of push up the stolen base guy. Uh, you wouldn't know anything about that. I wouldn't know anything about that, but uh, he's. Uh, I have I have nightmares of Delano to Shield still. I, that was the guy exactly who I was thinking of. I was saying saying you, by <laughs> oh, the way. But uh, that he, was a rough one. He has for more. He has more power than to Shield, yeah. so that he's not quite as limited of a hitter. I hate the really limited hitters. You know, it's Malik Smith. Nobody is taking him this year. He doesn't have uh, a job, yeah. and he was a guy going that. Uh, you know, every year there's a there's a speedy guy that we talk about that's always every overrated. Year. Whether it's yep. Billy Hamilton or DeShields or Malik Smith, you know, I'm not gonna. Okay, I'm kind of gonna you know, declare victory on that one just a little bit. But you know, I'm sure there's times I've missed out on a good stolen base guy because of my bias. But I'm telling you, you know, you you got you really want to get stolen bases early so you don't have to get the steals only guy later on. I think that's the key point. Is a you just don't want to get yourself in that spot where you have to do it. And B, if you do, you just have to push him up around because if you don't get that one guy, then you're totally gone. So I end up, you talk yeah. about the Shields, like I had no steals in that league and I had to move him up a couple rounds because I was like, if I don't get him, then I'm really dead in steals. And then you end up taking a guy you don't really want, take a guy really you want don't too early and over someone you do like. It's just, it, you just, it's and you still don't get the stolen bases. Yeah. You still, yeah, yeah. He, got, he got hurt like the first week, but you just, you just, it just the whole thing snowballs in a bad situation. You've yeah. got to. It's it's interesting. You look at those, you know, the first three or four rounds. You just, you got to find a way to get some steals out of the, out right. of those rounds. By the way, that was really nice how you taunted me on uh, via text about D Gordon signing as the Reds' next shortstop. Uh, <laughs> thanks. I saw I saw a report about that. It wasn't I didn't make that up. Oh, okay. I thought you might have because I did no, not see was, said report. But there was a report. It was D Gordon and someone else. I can't remember. The other guy was a little bit uh, more interesting. I forget who it was, but it was. Uh, I I laughed because I knew I knew that'd be a perfect fit for you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Scott. Appreciate you. Um, and you know, but that—that's a but he fits that profile of a player, you know. And it's great when you're getting 50 stolen bases out of him, but for sure, yeah, it's, you also could lose a job. Now, I think your favorite punching bag from last year, Adalberto Montes, he has graduated from the lose playing time risk club. Uh, yeah, I think his uh, Babe Ruthie in a like three week stretch last year, we had a home run. Uh, every at batter had a stolen bases. Kind of, kind of limits that. I think the leash is. Uh, he's leash is definitely longer. Um, he still can't hit though. He can hit a little. He can't. A little bit. Yeah. I mean, I'm you're not, not. You're never gonna get him. I can appreciate that. I, I am never gonna get him. I, I. Not even. You know, you don't need a league full of sieges to not get him. You yeah. you won't get him. Period. That's true. I, I I I see it from a fancy angle. I I fully admit that if it clicks, he could be. You know, like the uh, top five value. Uh, you know, when you look at the end of the year right, on on money roto rankings, but I just I can't do it with the profile at the at the second round price. Okay, his range is twelve to forty seven. Now I don't know if one of those leagues is like an OBP league or something, but this is this is <laughs> it's a it's a four by four a private OBP, OBP league drafted with yeah. the NFBC software. Somehow get his his max pick is forty seven. Uh, you're you you take him there, wouldn't you? Uh, 100%. I'd take it. I'd find a way to use him at 47 for sure. I just, uh, he just never did. I mean, his ADP is 24. So that's middle second round. He'd have to get to uh, middle third round for me to take him. Okay, fair. So yeah, I mean, there's a, there is definitely a spot and there could be a weird draft where it would look weird because I would end up with him, but it would have to be, he'd have to slip further than he ever will, at least in the main event. That's for sure. Okay. If anything, I think he goes up in, in March. And I just think that the stolen base uh, thing is going to, is going to be real. Yeah, for sure. Um, a guy you want to talk about at this range, uh, Jose Urquidy in Houston. Um, looked good last year. He was uh, he missed the first five weeks, what we think was COVID. I don't know if it was ever fully announced, but obviously, you know, he was out with it, and we didn't know if he had it or was tracing. But uh, you know, I think the fact that he missed the first five weeks, you can be pretty sure that he he did come down with that. Mm-hmm. Three point nine five ERA in forty one innings, twenty four percent K rate. Um, the the K rate ramped up uh, ramped up in the minors, but it hasn't really moved to major leagues. Like he was he was good. It was kind of slow K rate in the minors. Then 2019 in, in AA and AAA, he had a really big bump there. It hasn't really translated. 
Um, you want to talk about Arquiti, so how, how do you feel about him? I know you liked him last year, I believe. I like him this year. I don't know why you wouldn't like him this year. I understand strikeouts were down, but he coming back from an illness. I mean, he, yeah, he was. I mean, I think you totally write it off. I, you absolutely write off the lack of case because he demonstrated him in previous years. In 2019, 40 Ks in 41 innings. In the minors that year, 94 Ks in 70 innings. They're coming back. Give me, give me a Urquidy over Framber for the price, and almost straight up. Wow, that's uh, that's a, that's a that's a bold take here. I like it. Yeah, well, because everybody and Framber's everybody loves Framber. Yeah, it's a network sequel, a sitcom now. Everybody loves Framber. Every time I see a draft, I'm like, oh my god, Framber went in the fifth round. Like it's 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 wild. It's just he's just that's just where he goes. He goes like five six turn every draft. And why? Because of a three week playoff run. I guess it's six seven turn. His ADP is like ninety, but I've seen him in the fifth sixth round and it just jumps out to me every time. I just it's weird to see his name among the other names and I have to get used to it. But um, yeah, I take Arkady at pick two twenty. Uh, definitely over Framber in the sixth. Yeah, I, I think they should both be like. 15th round players um you know wow. I, I maybe you, maybe you you hate framber no i don't i don't hate him <laughs> i just he had a 357 era last year and then he was great in the playoffs yeah. because he was great in the playoffs everybody remembers that but i don't know it, i it's, i don't hate i definitely i promise you i don't hate i'm not a hater I, scott i'm kidding i don't have darkness in my heart like you do um i i I'm, wow no i'm just being silly yeah like uh, but. The 2019 walk rate on Framber scares me just enough that I probably am not finding myself getting him in the sixth round. Yeah, I mean, he improved by a ton last year. It he wasn't did. just the playoffs. Yeah. I, I need to kind of I, – I was overstating my case, but because the walk rate really did improve, and so did the K rate. So, uh, I the guess. Price, the price is a little rich for me. I see it, but the price is just a little rich for me. Yeah, I mean, it could be one of those. This is the last time you'll get him at this, and you know, the the year after he's a third round guy, and I'm the one with the egg on my face. But I just I think, think he's going too. I think soon. the other thing is like right in that range, right there, pitching just falls off. Like Kyle Hendricks goes right at kind of the end of the sixth, middle sixth, him and Barrios, and then there's like no starting pitches for a while. It's, it's right. pretty much Framber right. and Zach Wheeler, and then you go like you're way down. And you get Ian Anderson, you go down to Lazardo. Like he's just kind of a dead range for pitching, and if you are in the sixth round, you're like, oh my god, I have one starter. Like, you got to push someone up, and I think Framber's often, oftentimes that guy. Framber or Granky? Who, who, go, who should, who would you take first? Man, that's tough. Um, probably Framber, actually. Wow. I know you'd take Granky. Yeah, uh, I, I see the reason for concern. Granky's velocity is down, but he's never really got by on the velocity. It's, it's always, it's always down, right? He throws like, it's on like 77 in spring training every year. Yeah, Shelley uh, Versteg uh, had uh, a. Uh, a tweet about aren't we worried about the the arm issues coming up in the playoffs? And I was like, yes, except he he subs- followed that by throwing a gem against the uh, Rays in the ALCS, and it is. I mean, yeah, at some point he's going to fall off, and it's going to catch up to him. That and there, there's you can only lose so much velocity, even as a non-velocity guy. I really didn't like the the September performance from Granke. Yeah, you do the the Rays start is is true. I just you look at like his last six starts and kind of none of them were really good. It's just uh, I don't know yeah. what was going on there. It's uh, it's enough to maybe push me to someone else. I get you. I, I'm gonna end up with him. I already got him in one league and really came close in another. Uh, I just I, I think I think the you know in a year where innings are gonna be hard to come by, I think they'll just let him go. Uh, yeah. 67 to 9k to walk last year too by the way yeah you know it, i mean it's just his control that, but, is stupendous yeah his k rate or his walk rate was like 3.7 percent or something like whatever it was i, I looked earlier but um i 3.3 percent. whip is a category it know? is and that and that's it and that i kind of with runs with offense people kind of forget about whip a little bit when they're everybody mentions era and strikeouts and you know the whip is just as much a category as the other ones and he was he's 0.98 in 2019 like that's elite yeah and he doesn't give up homers he just he knows it, it sounds weird, but he just knows how to pitch. And I hate when people say that, but he's just, he's the one guy that just really knows how to pitch. He's hilarious. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think the love has almost gone too far now. But at the same time, like you know, Rob Rob Friedman always has stuff on him, and it's crazy. I mean, the the you go YouTube and Granky slow pitches. It's crazy. You know, some of those Epas pitches he throws. It's just like this is amazing. I love it. 
he has a little fun out there, which is it's a good thing. So, yeah. uh, bunch more guys I want to talk about, but first a note from our sponsor, BetMGM. Sports bettors know that magic happens when you turn a hunch into action and apply the right amount of expertise. That's why BetMGM is teamed with RotoWire to offer new BetMGM customers a free six month RotoWire subscription when they place their first bet. Register on the BetMGM app or website and use promo code ROTO, that's R O T O, to claim your free subscription. Once you make your first sports wager, you receive a season's length of RotoWire's unmatched sports insights. Find out why BetMGM is the king of sports books by signing up and placing your first bet today. Visit BetMGM.com for terms and conditions. 21 years of age or older to wager. Colorado, Indiana, Iowa, New Jersey only. Please gamble responsibly. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 522 4700 in Colorado, Nevada. 1 800 Gambler, New Jersey, and West Virginia. In Tennessee, call or text the red line at 800 889 9789. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem in Indiana, call 1 800 9 with it. Promotional offer not available in Nevada. So we've talked about a bunch of hitters and starters, Jeff. I want to hit a hit a couple closers here for a second. Okay. First guy I want to talk about is Richard Rodriguez in Pittsburgh. Uh, ADP on him is about 222 right now. Uh, his 2020, I don't know, you know, as much as you want to buy the 23 innings, jumps off the page. He was uh, he was 34 strikeouts to five walks in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, swing strike rate jumped to 15 percent. He had a 36.6 percent .6 strikeout rate after 22 percent in 2019. Um, it's uh, he had a really hard hit rate, but I guess when you're striking everybody out, it doesn't matter quite as much. He threw twice as many sliders last year, so a little bit of a pitch mix change. 63.6 percent whiff rate in a slider, which is just absurdly ridiculous. He threw 27. He threw that pitch 27 percent of the time. It was, from, it was 13 percent the year before, 14 percent somewhere in there. The Pirates will be awful. He will get dealt at some point if he's pitching well, mm -hmm. but it's his job to start. So as long as he doesn't get dealt in the preseason, at least you might get. Uh, you know, I don't know where the trade deadlines would be if the season starts late, but three to four months of Rodriguez closing. Teams do, even bad teams, win close games at some point. Um, how do you feel about Rodriguez off the off the crazy 2020? And in fact, bad teams, when they win, they win close games more than yep. they do otherwise. Uh, and I think the comparison's already been made, but to like Shane Green with the Tigers, except better yep. pitcher. And this isn't an isolated season where this is the only time he's good. 2018, 88 to 19 K to walk in 69 innings. I mean, it's always been there. Uh, I like him. I like him. I don't trust the Pirates. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised the Pirates find some stupid veteran to put in over him just so they don't have to pay him as much but and keep him around another year. That's possibly too. And I, that's not fair to the veterans. They're not. They're, it's not their fault they're veterans. They're not stupid. It's just the Pirates are being but I mean, stupid. I, I just think that in this situation, I think they want to trade him, so I think they're going to have him close games. I think that ups his trade value. Could be. Yeah. And he's 30 years old. It's not like he's a young guy you're trying to keep That's down true. arbitration. That's I just, uh, I mean, they have they have a couple guys. They have Michael Feliz. They have Kyle Crick. Like I just, I think he's just so far and away the the guy there. I just, I, I think he's going to be the guy. And and keep in mind, they're being presumptively stupid here, not actually stupid this time. So I might be being a little unfair. Right. Uh, but. I, I mean, I like him. I, I think you're right. I mean, there is always a possibility they bring somebody in, but I think that's actually a good point. He's not some young, he's not 23 year old fireballer. He's a 30 year older. Uh, and so that, that's actually a really good point. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, they really are spending no money whatsoever. And none. <laughs> yeah. He's not costing them anything. But if he can get them some prospects, I guess that's, that's a path. Uh, I think it's worth the risk. And, you know, he might even get traded to a team that uses him as the closer, too. That's yeah, also certainly possible. possible. Yeah. So his ADP right now is 222. If we get to we get to March, we get main event drafts, and the Pits, the Pirates have not traded him. Um, what do you think his ADP in main events ends up? Like 185 ish. Raise. I think Raise. 150. Because so you gotta, you're you're probably right because there's so few closers with jobs. Clo closer, yeah. It just I'm going through like, just doing this DC these two DCs that I've been doing really kind of helps you know, shape that, that closer market for me right now. The, you know, you're, it's probably cl closer to your estimate. His, his min pick is 145. I, I don't know if his average will get there, but I'm telling you, you're trying to find security in closers, trying to get a guy that gets the saves, you know, he's safe. Really hard to find that guy. I mean, look at the Cardinals, a good team. We have no idea who's going to close. It's probably, it might be Jordan Hicks, but it might be three other guys, four other yep. guys. This is one example. Uh, the Padres, we don't know who's going to close for them yet. Uh, the yes. Reds, we don't know who's going to close for them. I, I think you're, you're the key. I think with his price is down a little because I think people are worried they're going to trade him in the preseason. All of a sudden, you end up with a setup guy in the you mm -hmm. know thirteenth, fourteenth round. So I think that keeps it down a little bit. But that's why I asked. You know, as we get to March, you know they're not going to trade him at that point. I think that 
the answer might be between our two guesses, maybe in the maybe in the 170, something like that, maybe kind of 11, Probably 11, so, 11 or something 12. like that. Yeah. But, you know, it's just trying to figure out that closer mark. And, it, and as we've discussed many times before, every like main, ad- main event draft is its own closer economy. Yep, very yeah, true. You know, where if the run of third tier closers begins in the eighth, well, okay, that's where he's, you know, then that's when you're going to start looking at the, some of these there. Yeah, speaking of closer battles, who, who's going to close for the A's? Is it going to be Deekman? Is it going to be Wendelkin? Or is it going to be pitcher to be named later? I think it's probably Deekman to start with a, uh, you know, maybe a, a third of the time they throw Wendelkin in there as kind of a matchup play and, and figure it out. But I think it'll be Deekman to start off the off the 2020. But as you can tell, I'm not super uh, super happy about the whole situation. But yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's Deekman to start, and then but I, I don't think it's a full like he's the guy. I think it might be a two third one third kind of thing. I mean, our organizations are so remarkably similar right now. We just have fired fewer scouts than you guys have. <laughs> you're, you're paying some of your employees, actually? Yeah, apparently. Uh, apparently. Although they may have started with fewer to begin with, for all I know. If I were in a D.C., because you're, you're asking me for the A's here. If I were in a D.C. and I was looking to speculate on the saves and the A's, I would go late and I'd take Lou Trevino. I was just going to ask you about him. You like him, huh? I do, and I think he's the guy that they – I mean, he was so good in – um, what was that 2018 and then really struggled last year or 2019 and was was better last year you could see the you see the strikeouts came back the era dropped um, he looked like the guy that uh, you know could wipe out guys with that slider last year i think that uh, if they could pick someone to like step up and take the job i think it'd be him so that's if i was going to speculate at dc it'd be him okay yeah so since you're talking about closers i want there's a couple other guys you mentioned that you want to talk about in this range uh, you mentioned drew pomerantz we, you mentioned uh, san diego uh Obviously, a really good 2020 at a 1.45 ERA in 18 innings, innings last year. <laughs> Ridiculous strikeout rate at 39.7%. Um, 30.1% in 2019. That was part of the year as a starter, too. Like, and that ramped up as mm-hmm. he as he got to the bullpen and started throwing harder, really gassing him out. The one thing with Pomerantz with me, there's actually two things that scare me a little bit here. I think that they want to split with him and Emilio Pagan. I don't really think they want him to like be the guy. I think they want to use him in a, in a more of a role to go against lefties in seventh, eighth inning and kind of mix and match. And the walks scare me. I hate closers who walk guys. He had a 13.7% walk rate last year. I know it was only 18 innings. He was 10% the year before. Um, the walks scare me enough here that I would certainly go Rodriguez first. Um, but in this range, there's not a lot of guys here. But I think the splitting of the job plus the walks keep me off Pomerantz as a, as a guy that I'll probably grab. Yeah. Um, in the DC that I'm currently in, I did grab Pomerantz. So I'm glad. Uh, but I think it, it was also, again, closers went a little earlier. And I'm pulling up the board now. I did. I, I didn't quite set them in on him, but it was early. But as it turns out, I, I was one pick ahead of where he would have gone because Todd Zola said I sniped him. I got him early, like twelve point twelve point five is when I got him in that in that draft. So Rosenthal was still available. He went in that same round. He's the other risk factor for San Diego if they re-sign I, him. I think he ends up there, which is then makes Pomerantz probably you know a third of the closer and Rosenthal two thirds, but. I mean, if you want to argue for Pomerantz, I mean, since he became a reliever, he has been really damn good. He has. He really has. Yeah, he, ha- uh, he hasn't punched a chair in like two years. Yeah, well, and that that it's funny how that, that still, translates still, into better mad. results. By the way, Rodriguez went before that. He went at eleven point fourteen. So yeah, I would t- guess. I would kind guess of she's demonstrates a... the the closer market. Yeah. In this in this particular draft, and that's the thing is every draft is different. Uh, you know, in, like others were like Montero was already gone. Yeah, I like him in Seattle, but I do too. I, in fact, you know, it's weird because Seattle was very fluid in who closed for him last year, where investing in any of them meant immediate loss. But like Kimbrel was already gone. He will frequently go later in some drafts, but not here. Our buddy Vlad uh, took both Kimbrel and Montero, actually. Do you, uh, do you like Kimbrel? Do you know me? I do. I know you don't. I know that Chris List will like him, so I, I know the answer to that. But I, no, I, I to be fair, last he, year he got better. Weird. Like he struck out or walked everybody. It was it was wild last year. Yeah, he actually improved tangibly. His the month of September was way better. I will consider taking him this year. Last year I was flat out off of him. Yeah. Uh, I also still don't have that great. You know, I still have a pretty high ERA projected for him, and it, part of that is you know previous year inputs i mean it's hard you know i've got him improving to 480 but he was 528 last year 653 the year before i mean he was really really awful but the k's are there i mean it's it's a gamble but the cubs want him want this to work they didn't resign jeffress 
I think they that... paid him, and he's the leash is pretty good there. But that's four or five years now. It's not just one year. It's four or five years where walks have been a gigantic, gigantic problem for him. Yeah, uh, and it's just it's no fun watching a guy that walks the ballpark. No fun I mean, at all. We talked we talked earlier about Pomerantz in the in the short sample. I mean, Kimbrell in four or five years the walk rate over twelve percent. Yeah, Kimbrell walked three batters against the Reds on August 29th. Those were his last walks. He was. Season. I think it was like 13 of his last 14 outings were scoreless. He was definitely better at the end of the season. And, uh, you know, it kind of pulls you back in. But uh, the control does scare me with him. I don't know. I, I'm warming up more by looking at the game log, though. Yeah. I mean, no, the game log's good. The game log's impressive. It, uh, he was a different guy the last, like, 14, 15 He minutes. definitely fixed something there uh, after that hideous outing against the Reds. Uh, after he was wretched against them. I mean, I... I think they actually won that game, but he had to get pulled, if I recall correctly. Uh, he had two, if I recall, he had two bad outings against the Reds. Yeah, he did. The very first one of the year was against the Reds in July 27. That was the hideous, hideous outing where he had four walks in a third of an inning. But over his last seven and, seven and a third, no runs allowed, 13 Ks, no walks. Uh, that's something I'm interested in. 16, uh, 16 K to nine. Yeah. The, uh, the strikeouts were insane. And you, you want to talk about a guy whose ADP is meaningless right now. His ADP is one ninety seven. There's no way he gets out of the top one fifty in main events. Right. Uh, it's, and I, I filtered for just the month of January. Yeah. And it's uh one ninety nine pitcher, pitcher number 70, uh, with a range of one twenty two to three fifty seven. So there's, there's some range there. <laughs> he's a, he's a, he's a ninth round guy in the main event, I think. I think you're right. So the other uh, closer I wanted to talk about here in this uh, in this 200s range is uh, Stefan Crichton in Arizona. Um, took over late for the Diamondbacks. He had five saves. He had a 2.42 ERA, pretty good, uh, really good year in 26 uh, innings. He's not a strikeout guy. His, his K rate was 21% last year, but it was 26, 27% in 2019. So he's, he was pretty good there. Uh, wasn't a very good big K guy in the minors. So I don't think you're going to get there, but it's just. Uh, Hard hit raise a little of it, but he only allowed one barrel all year. The curve, the curveball is kind of his key. It's a 44% whiff rate, uh, 187x slug, 135 batting average against it last year. That pitch was really good. Um, Those 60 percent sinkers, 37% curveballs. Was a two pitch guy. Um, he was good last year. I just, I don't. It, it seems like he's the guy in Arizona, but you know, there's a lot of ways that guys could sign still and end up there. But um, for right now, he seems like he's the closer at the, in, for the Diamondbacks. Yeah, but it's not like the Diamondbacks have ever like jerked us around with the, the closer yeah. position or anything like that. So, yeah. yeah, totally safe to go. Cleared sailing ahead. Go for it. Now, um, sure. Maybe I'll trade for Greg Holland real quickly and mess it up. Yeah, I've actually got a pretty optimistic projection for him. Um, I've got him for 28 saves. Take that for what it's worth. It, maybe it's an absence of competition too. You know, although guys. You know, guys can get moved from the rotation. Guys can get, you know, learn a pitch, and all of a sudden they're they're a lot better. Uh, all it takes is one blown save, and hey, Kevin Ginkle's back up again, and you know, there you go. So, uh, and you know, you're looking at the Diamondbacks' step chart. They actually have extra starting pitchers again, just like last year. Uh, you know, it, it has a way of sorting itself out. But Gallons are obviously set. Caleb Smith, if he's healthy, is in there. Mad Bum is in there, even though he's terrible. But because what else are you going to do with him? But could you see a universe where Luke Weaver gets moved to the bullpen and all of a sudden is really good? Yes, I, I think that'd be an interesting move. I don't know if they'll do it because I think they want him starting. But yeah, he's a that's a guy that I would love to maybe gas it out for an inning in the in the ninth. Yeah, Merrill Kelly's trying to come back from thoracic outlet, so we'll see about that. That's never never a good luck. But I mean, I they... want you, I want you to guess what you think Mad Bum's barrel percentage was last year as a pitcher, obviously. Oh, I don't even know. Um, I, I just know it's horrible, and, and I know you love to slag him. So just tell me. 14.9 percent yikes that's it's, it's the worst in baseball by a good amount he he's he's legit terrible right now yeah well he uh, yeah had a phenomenal career single-handedly won a world series himself in 2014 um he's bad right now do not do not take him at his adp he lost three miles an hour off of his fastball last year from 2019 uh, that's just, a hard way to make a living now and then a you know of, he got hurt of inning. I mean, so the fact is, he had an arm problem, uh, and, a, and well, sore back too, which often is kind of tied into a shoulder. May if if that's fixed, maybe he gets that velocity back. If if he's throwing ninety one instead of eighty eight again, are, are you interested at all? Nope. No, no way, no how. Okay. I hope is I hope he I hope he does and his price goes up. But uh, 
Not all my fades were good last year, thanks Shane Bieber, but uh, my Madison Bumgarner fade did work out well. I wanted no part of him last year, and he uh, he performed admirably. Which which player did you do more laps for, uh, Mad Bum or Victor Robles? <laughs> Probably Victor Robles because people love Victor Robles. I remember someone tweeted at me last year on opening day when he hit that home run off the foul pole that like was the cheesiest home run ever. It's like, well, I guess we're wrong on Robles, and I was like, all right, well, let's wait a month or so. But uh, yeah. I did not go back at him because that's not who I am, but. Uh, yeah, it was. I thought it was funny that uh, people people love Victor Robles. And you know, I'm joking because you don't take victory laps. That's the whole point. No, I know. There, there may have been a Twitter conversation or seventeen about victory laps last year. So people, uh, people, I just say, had to people throw take that victory laps. I didn't. I never. I never see those. Yeah. Um, speaking, <laughs> it's a really good segue. You did well there, um, Andrew Benintendi, uh, another guy that uh, has not been a friend of mine. Uh, ADP is two twenty eight. He only played fourteen games last year. He got hurt. Uh, the 14 games were horrendous. He hit 103. He had no home runs. He was just, just terrible. 2019 was rough. We've talked about it a lot. Hit 266, 13 home runs, 10 stolen bases. Um, you know, decent line there, but rough for obviously where he was like a second or third round draft pick that year. And it's weird because, I mean, he was really good. He was 2020 in 2017, 16, 21 in 2018. Clearly made a change in his approach going to 2019. Tried to hit more fly balls, tried to hit more power, <laughs> struck out more. Um, but he clearly changed his swing. He's one of those guys, like, you look at the stats and clearly he did something different. We don't know what 2020 is going to look like. It obviously started poorly, but 14 games, like, who cares at that point? Is 228 enough of a discount down here that uh, you're thinking about jumping back on board? I think not, because I think he's just all in his own head about this. I mean, it's hard because, you know, was he playing hurt the entire time? Or did he get hurt trying so hard, trying to tweak his swing, change his mechanics to adjust for his slump? I mean, he had one extra base hit last year. Uh, it's, it's, you know, sometimes when a guy slumps, lets you down, you, you get him wrong. Sometimes you go with, you double down on it and say he owes me because the fundamentals yeah. are there. I don't think they're really there. And and I don't, I don't think we can know if they're there too because they were so much different in 2019. We just have no data from 2020. But, I mean, like his swinging strike rate was 7.5% in the first three years. Like right in there, every year, mm -hmm. the first three years. And then it was 11.6% in 2010. He like... Just complained, but became became a different guy when he didn't need to. He was like a really good player before that, and you know, I, I we talked him as a fade that year. But in fact, fantasy wise, he was a really good baseball player, and I just don't know what happened. Yeah, uh, and I drafted him last year. Uh, I think you might have ended up with him in a league I, too. I did too. He kind of slipped. I was like, oh, at this point, I'll take him, and it did not work out very well. Apparently, yeah, uh, he could he could prove you know go fifteen twenty and prove us all wrong. I mean, I, the fact that the Red Sox were taught, oh, I don't know if it's a fact, but the fact that uh, it was reported that his he was available in trade talks doesn't speak well to the Red Sox confidence in him coming back yeah. either. So uh, I, I'm probably get, I'm going to need a severe haircut there on his draft price. I probably you think won't get him. he's like hitting six to start the year if he stays in Boston. Would they put Verdugo up top and move him down? Probably. I would think so. I mean, I don't think you can put him up top right now until he actually does something. A few more guys I want to ask you about. We've gone a little bit long here, as we tend to do. Um, Ryan Yarborough was someone that you and I uh, both liked last year. He had a good year, 55 innings, uh, 3.56 ERA, 1.19 whip. Um, he's never going to be a strikeout guy. We know that. It was like 18.8%. Uh, it's weird, though. I looked a little closer. His swing strike rate last year was 13.3%. Yeah. What? Way I... up. He was top 20 in swing strike rate. I, I just don't know if that was like a little bit weird. I mean, he the changeup was the change It's not off good. his fastball. That's the thing. Yeah, it is. It is his changeup and his curveball had thirty six percent or higher whiff rates last year. I was shocked when I looked a little closer. Yeah, I can't tell though if that's like a you know it's, it's something maybe he can is coming and the K rate's going to jump up or maybe it's just the way he pitches. But um, I was surprised that he gets as many swing and misses as he does. Yeah, same. I I, I, saw, I noticed that too when I was doing his projection earlier uh, in the off season, but. Here's the trend that I don't like. 89.4, 88.2, 87.4. Those are your average fastball velocities. I also don't like that the Rays no longer use an opener in front of them. Uh, tw only twice did they do so last year. You know, he, he, the way they manage pitching, he specifically also seems like a candidate that gets pulled before he gets through five a lot. Yeah, he had a, he's a frustrating that way. Yeah. Do you how, how much do you buy a guy who consistently limits hard contact? He was a 99th percentile in exit velo last year, 98th percentile in hard contact. He's under 27% all three years of his career. Um, we talked about that, you know, contact a, a lot. And then, you know, we talked about the I, I really pay attention to it on the extremes. The guys really are high and low. Mm hmm. But years in a row like that, I mean, you, you kind of feel there's something to that. He, he just generates a lot of soft contact. 
he does and he gets by with that yeah it's scary a little bit because you know once that goes 87 miles an hour like who knows where we're going but um i think i'm back in at pick 244 as a guy who will be solid not great but solid i think i probably need a little bit more of a discount but i'll probably end up with them in some places i think like a tout wars type of league or i'm I, maybe a main but like i alluded i it's really frustrating if you you know wins wins are a category it is and he had one I'd, uh, last year i'd love oh god he had one yes i knew it was low i didn't know one point one point one no yeah. wonder I was low in wins on a couple teams. Um, I'd love them to bring back the opener for him. That's for darn sure. Yeah. A couple other guys here. I want to ask you about Nick Senzel. You are the Reds fan. <laughs> um, this is a guy that looked exciting in 2019. 12 home runs, 14 stolen bases in only 414 plate appearances. Was a, a big prospect. Everybody's excited about him coming up. Uh, definitely was bad last year. He had the injuries, but he played 23 games, hit 186. Where do you uh, where do you feel on that says all right now? You're the Reds guy. I'm just gonna let you talk about him. I thought that I wasn't gonna get him anywhere. I thought that hey, I'm not gonna fall for this banana in the tailpipe again. And then round 19 comes around. I need a little bit of speed. I have outfield spot uh, spots open. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that again. Anyhow, uh, how and... do you not, how do you not in round 19? I mean, the the speed's there. He's he's fast. He's got yeah. a. Yeah, decent barrel rate in 2019. How do you think the playing time works out? I know it's kind of a all over the place. Roster resource has him on the bench right now, but um, that's garbage. I trust, I, I trust you with the Reds more than anybody. I mean, else. He's going to well, be starting that's... in center field. Yeah. Who's going to play ahead of him? What, who do they have? I don't even want to know. I'm going to get angry over that. So, um, and I don't uh, want to well, slag I'm, another I'm, site. I'm, uh, I'm going to get... tell you anyway. It's they have Akiyama in center, Castellanos in right, and Jesse Winker in left. Okay, they're assuming there's no DH then. That's that's, that's no going to be. Okay, yes. I'm assuming there's a DH. Okay. Now, okay, assuming if, if we have to go that way, um, I think it'll be more no go for Shogo if it if push comes to shove because you need you need offense, and Akiyama maybe he can get on base a little bit. He should, he can't hit his way out of a pet, wet paper bag. He's got no power, um, which is funny because he hit 20 plus regularly in Japan, but um, so did Aki Iwamura, and uh, you know. That that's the, someone made that comparison, and I forget who it was on Twitter that did. I apologize, I'm not giving attribution on this one. But when he signed with the Reds a year ago, someone made that comp, and I was like, yeah, but I don't think that's the same. Now I I see him hit, I watch him play. Yeah, he's he's got very little punch. Unless is there he's... is there no chance of Senzel back to the infield? No, I don't think there's much of a chance. Um, they would have had him work on it by now. I, it, yeah. Senzel's just got to get through a season healthy. I mean that that's really the problem. Um, but at that price, I have to get have to go on it because I, I think I do too. Especially stolen bases are so hard to get, and you know if he plays, if he plays most of the time, like he could steal 15, 15 to eighteen bags pretty easily, right? Yeah, I mean I could. I, I and the thing is, I have a pretty modest projection on him. I have him for one hundred and ten games. You know, I have him hitting two thirty seven. Uh, I mean, it could blow up in my face, but he's also the second pick on a draft in an SEC bat. And I guess <clears throat> so is Ben and Tendi, but I'm, yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm going to be intellectually consistent here. But, uh, it, okay, I've got my Reds blinders on a little bit, but he also dealt with COVID last year. He dealt with a sprained ring finger and a groin injury, and that's part of his package. He's always and hurt. I, I think the COVID thing is important, too, because I think, I think we're seeing, especially we're seeing in the NBA right now, everybody recovers a little bit differently. And it oh, just, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Draymond Green last night, he's been back for, he missed the first four games. They played 20 games. He's like, I'm still three weeks away from being like fully ready to go. And like, I think it's just affecting guys differently. And there's, there's no way to judge, you know, kind of how it works for each guy. It's case by case. Yeah. Freddie, Freddie Freeman was deathly ill. And then was an MVP. Yeah. You know, exactly. Yon Moncada said he was sluggish for a month. Yep. Eduardo Rodriguez got clearance to walk after six months. Crazy. Yeah. I mean, the, the Moncada one just because like, three or four weeks in he was like yeah I, you guys are still tired every day and he's just like it's just weird how it affects everybody differently and i think that you kind of have to take a case by case and i think that's real with Sunzel. i think it picked 280 i mean you, you can't get hurt there like if he if he struggles or gets hurt or they don't start him he's not playing enough you just drop him i mean it's a right it's an 18th ninth round pick like you're gonna drop some of those guys anyway but the upside is real there yeah it's a dc so i'm not dropping anybody but i just have to sure. have to draft redundancies though yeah and that that's the risk Last guy I want to talk about. I'm trying to figure out who to pick here. I want to talk about uh, Justice Sheffield in Seattle. All right. Uh, a really solid 2020. 3.58 area and 55 and two thirds. His FIP was 3.17. He's a huge ground ball guy. He's not a big strikeout guy. He's like a low 20% strikeout rate guy, but over 50% 
ground ball guy in his major league years. Uh, walks are a little bit concerned. He did drop that down a little bit last year. But you look at – we talk about uh, the game log, and I forget who it was. Or we were talking about Kimbrell's game log. You look mm-hmm. at Sheffield's game log. The first two starts of the year were really bad. His last eight starts, seven of them were two earned runs or fewer. And in six of those, he threw six innings or more. So, like, he was actually going deep into games. We see so many guys that are four, five, five, six, five. And he was, like, six, six, seven, six. I mean, like, there's some good innings in there, which is great for wins. You know, who knows if Seattle can score runs. But the last the last uh, end of the season, he made eight starts. He had four wins, a 2.64 ERA, 41 to 14 strikeout to walk. Um, I just really like what I saw at the end of last season. He's picked 288. He's locked into the starting rotation. There's no doubt that he's one of their guys. Um Pitching's really hard to find after like round twelve or even round ten. Yeah, he's a guy that he's there picking around eight nineteen right now. I'm gonna push him up. He's gonna be like around fifteen or sixteen guy for me pretty easily when when we get closer. Yeah, maybe I think so. I uh, you know the slider is fun to watch. I mean, it's it a is. sweet pitch. Yeah, uh, he induces a ton of grounders. That helps. I you love, mentioned that, that stretch. Um, I'm looking at that game log and you know. It, it's you know, faced A's on the last day of the season or close that, to. That, that's a powerhouse. That's yeah. The one. Uh, and they might have, I think they may have already clinched by then. Uh, he faced the Padres tough lineup. Okay. Yep. But Arizona, Texas, Angels, Texas, Houston, Colorado. <sighs> For sure. I think that, that factors in. I just think he, it's a, it's a hard part of the draft to find someone who I think is going to be solid. Right. I don't think it's going to be great. I think he's going to be solid, and he's going to pitch a lot of innings. Mm-hmm. He's going to get out there every fifth day, and I think that holds a lot of value, especially in this season where we're going to have seven inning doubleheaders and, and guys are going to skip starts and guys aren't going to throw them many innings. I just think he, at that price, he's someone that I think you can kind of count on to be solid for. You'd be able to throw him out there most weeks. Yeah, I, I agree. And like he had, Which is boring but has value. You know, this, his first two starts were terrible, last yep. eight. You know, he had a 264 ERA, 122 whip uh, in that uh, in, in that stretch, 41 Ks, 14 walks. Yeah, th- these are something these are things I'm interested in. Yeah. I, I, and he doesn't allow homers. And, you know, maybe he got a little home run lucky in terms of home run and fly ball. But if you're inducing a ton of ground balls, it would make sense. You're not you're not giving up a ton of uh, fly balls. You're not getting squared up. I mean, that's the whole point. Somewhere somewhere Brad Ziegler's listening and nodding. Yeah, and you know, it, ground balls, ground balls are good. And it means that you also need to rely, you need to have good defense behind you. Yep. And that's one thing with Seattle. It's like I'm not quite sure because they're they've got so many moving parts. You know, the the people that are playing might change quite a bit in that stretch. Uh, you know, is it Dylan Moore or Shed Long at second base or Ty France if he's standing with J- a glove somewhere? You J. worry J. a little bit. JP Crawford's really good defensively, right? I think so. Uh, yeah. Seager's good defensively. Yeah, so it's good a good left side at least, which is yeah. important. Especially uh, the lefty, you got a lot of righties up there pulling the ball. Right, they've got a stud shortstop prospect in uh, Noel V. Marte. I don't know if he'll come up this year or not, but he, he's a good defender too. So that that could be a good thing. Yeah, I'm, with a lefty with righties hitting a lot of ground balls, I'm uh, I'm good with that left side right now. Yeah, uh, uh, you, you've sold me on Sheffield. I'll probably bump him up a little bit in my projection. In fact, I'm turning that down right now. There you go. Anybody oh. else that uh, we've kind of gone a, a lot of guys here. I had some more guys talking about, but I think we had all the ones I really wanted to hit. Anybody else that you mentioned that I left out, you really want to hit on? No, I'm, I'm good. Uh, we've covered a lot today and uh, yeah. It, and it, I think, uh, I think we're going to do, uh, we're going to do after pick 300 uh, next week. I think we'll kind of. Uh... Please like our video and subscribe to Rotowire. Then go to rotowire.com slash pod for a free 10 day trial.